Good afternoon, and thank you so much for joining us at Dream Bank Madison on our virtual Facebook page. Um, today, we'll be having a discussion about trust and building high-functioning teams. Without further ado, I would like in, to let in, excuse me. Without further ado, I would like to let Luis introduce himself. Hey, Luis. Hi, Monica. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I am Luis Varela. I'm founder of Trusten. Uh, I am originally from Colombia, an industrial engineer who decided to change to education. And Trusten is kind of a little bit of the merge of that. And that, that is my project that I'm heading now. And that's what I want to talk today about. <laughs> That's awesome. I really appreciate you being here with us today. Um, to start, I would like you to let us know what Trust 10 is all about. Well, I would think the best way to do that is maybe to show you a little video uh, with what we do and what we used to do before the pandemic changed everything. So uh, we'll play a little bit of that video now. Thank you. Thank you. It appears that we may be having some trouble with our audio. Can you hear it, Louise? I can't hear it, no. Yeah, I can't hear it either. All right, well, um, in your own words, give me a, a just an overview about what it is that we're watching. Oh, the video. Yeah. Well, before the pandemic, this is the work that we, work that we do. We um, develop and customize workshops uh, based on the specific needs that teams have uh, mm -hmm. with, and, and give them tools to improve their communication, to improve how they relate to each other, how they integrate with each other to get results. And the way we do it is through social activities, meaningful activities. Most of them are based on social games, mm -hmm. uh, uh, playful ways especially when the subjects uh, tend to be a little more um, heavy, we tend to gamify it and we do reflections, we do all sorts of activities where the message and the interaction and the tools that we build together uh, mm -hmm. are easily understood. All right, I'm gonna try to pull up that video so that we can um, see a little bit of what it is that you're talking about. Perfect. Eric, press play, please. Let's see if we have audio. I still think we don't have audio. Yeah, we don't have audio, but tell me what's happening in the okay, okay. If he can start it from the beginning, I can show you. So these are, at the end, we have mostly people talking about their experience uh, and how they were interacting with each other. This is this moment, for example, here is they are sharing with each other some reflections about what we learned. These are some activities that we got, uh, that we engaged together about integration. Uh, there are some silly things that happen, but they also reveal your co-working in a different light where mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Basically, this playfulness comes out, which is something you don't see in uh, yeah, in your work. everyday work. Yeah, yeah. And it it gives you to see without going like into deep psychoanalysis of of your soul. It opens you up without that, and mm -hmm. and and it, and, and it opens the door to more meaningful engagement. You 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 start sharing things. Uh, more openly and with lightness instead of, um, you know, other very important things that you have to deal with psychologically, but that's not exactly what we do. We're trying to 
approach that openness from a lighter, more playful side, which is also something that is deep within us and that we don't get to show uh, at work. I see that with building that type of relationship with your coworkers and with building this type of understanding in any type of workplace that it requires trust and that's what you are all about um explain to me what trust means to you so yeah uh, there is uh, like a very broad definition of what trust is from miriam webster it says uh, reliance on the character ability and strength or truth or on something or someone uh, to rely on accuracy to rely on truthfulness but the way we see it applied to this is Trust is when you can feel, when I can feel that I can count on you to do what you let me to expect that you would do. Like if you say you were going to do something, so I would assume that you would do it and then you do it. And that's how we build trust. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very kind of practical hands-on application of trust at workplaces, for example. Mm -hmm. Um. So how does that translate to the workplace then? Um, just in general sense, how does that translate? Yeah, well, yes. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask you, we'll do a little trust and like activity right now to answer the question of how does it translate? Mm -hmm. and, and if people want to take a little breath right now, I will invite you to do that. You don't have to close your eyes, but if you want to close your eyes, you can close your eyes. Mm -hmm. It's not like a super spiritual thing. It's just a, a little bit of a visualization. Mm -hmm. so imagine, for example, you are commuting from your house to your work. And on that commute, you're thinking about work. And you realize that you're going to a place where you're sure that what you bring to this place is the best intentions. You have the best intentions when you go to work. Mm -hmm. And not only with others, but with the project that you're working on, that you are going to an environment where you can openly express how you feel and what you think to everyone that, that is with you at work. You feel that, you're driving and you see that. Oh, I'm going to a place where I can express anything freely uh, and that your purpose is solely to help that project. On the other hand, people also know that from you. They expect that from you, that you will have only the best intentions. And also for you, you know that when they come to you, whether they agree or disagree, they have only your, the best intentions of you and the best intentions of the project in hand. So you know, everyone comes with their best intentions. So whether they disagree with you, you have no, not necessarily fear, but you are expecting them to say because they know they want the best of you and of the project. So imagine that and now imagine you're going back to work. Well, excuse me, you're going back home now and you spend all day in this environment. And we know that we spend 60 to 80% of our waking life at work. So imagine that you go back to your home and this is the felt sense in your body that everyone there trusted you and you trusted them with issues at work. So that is an ideal scenario of a safe space of trust being translated to work. Mm -hmm. And another activity, so from one to 10, I will ask everyone, maybe they, you have a pen and paper or, or just to think about it. Would that feel one terrible to 10 great? And I know this is an ideal, this is fantasy. In trusting, we have a principle that says, uh, you can, we only have access to options that we can imagine. So when you can't even imagine it, the option is like it never existed. Mm -hmm. So trying to open that option when you, and 
So from one to 10, Monica, after, when you're going back to work, in, after you work on this environment, how would you feel, for example? I think I would feel absolutely great in that environment, going back to work, actually. Um, I really like this experiment. Um, I've never thought about it and never put it in that type of perspective. You know, for me, um, when trusting someone, sometimes, especially if it's a project that I'm working on, it's really hard to let go. It's really, really hard to um, trust someone. And it's not because I don't trust them or that I don't trust myself. I just want it to be the absolute best. And I always try to keep my hands on it to assure that that happens instead of allowing other people to express their greatness and show that they can be trusted with um, projects, even though it is my baby or my project. So being able to let go and trust my coworkers in that type of way, um, it's interesting. It's, it's definitely something I will think about. It's definitely interesting, but uh, we will we, we probably will delve a little more into it, but it will really, actually, I have something that will help with just what you said. And this is another trust and like activity. Mm -hmm. Very simple is, so let's take that ideal world that we just experienced in our minds. Like mm -hmm. it's so beautiful, everybody trusts each other. I know it's kind of a Narnia workland, but mm -hmm. let's assume that you have that relationship with coworkers and then apply this to real world occurrences. You know, life happens, things are good and bad. Mm -hmm. um, so. With that, I will ask you to maybe, if you have a pen and paper, to write yes or no on these answers, on this question, sorry. Um, in, that, in that ideal place that we just imagined, would you and your coworkers be more able to detect improvement areas uh, knowing that your coworkers and you have no fear in expressing them. You just express them. Mm -hmm. And they are being respectful, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so within that safe space, that's question number one first. Mm -hmm. uh, would, would people come out and say, hey, there's something here that needs improvement? Number two, would you think that happened, yes or no? Number two, would those... Uh, people speaking up to see improvements will happen more timely. You won't wait after the problem has gotten bigger. Mm -hmm. Will it be more timely? Yes or no? Yeah. In this ideal safe space, would you and your team take more creative risks to reach the goal, to overcome obstacles? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? Would you be happier to return to that kind of work environment the next day, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, now, if you're happier to return, would you be more open to listening others and hearing their input? Mm -hmm. All of that, you're enjoying this environment where you are listened to, you're seen. If it's required in a specific moment to go the extra mile, would you probably be more willing to go the extra mile in that kind of environment? Mm -hmm. Most definitely. Could this mean that the chances of turnover of personnel are lower? Yes. Right? Yeah. People would like to stay mm -hmm. maybe a little more than if they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so this amazing group, ideally, I know, we're still kind of fantasizing a little bit, mm -hmm. be more motivated to produce better results and save, and we will actually save money in rehiring and training. Mm -hmm. right? Could this mean that the whole project will reach its goal faster, be more efficient? Yes or no? Could this make you more fulfilled at work as manager, assistant, director, at any level of this organization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes or no? 
So I would invite everyone who's doing it with us to see how many yeses you have. Mm -hmm. And I think that's kind of the answer that I wanted to offer you about how this can be applicable to real business occurrences, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I want to share with you an example before I ask um, my next question. Um, this is a personal situation where I have a friend who owns a restaurant and um, I go there. She expresses to me how stressful it is and how much she needs help sometimes. And, um, you know, it's not a lot of people able to help her out. It's just she's a one person and it's her daughter helping her run the place. And she said, well, I really, really need help around the restaurant. And then I go there and I say, what can I do to help? And every time I start doing something, she comes right along and, and start doing, practically take it from me. And then I'll move on to something else. And then she comes along and take, take over that job. And um, with this discussion that we're having, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking, hey, this is um, a trust issue. It's not even, it's not even, you know, recently I just, um, I left her restaurant and we didn't have a spat about it or anything. I left in the middle of what I was doing. I felt really uncomfortable. I felt um, unheard and I felt like I wasn't trusted. I And I didn't even realize until now that I felt like I wasn't trusted, but I felt something and didn't know what it was, but I just left and she and I had a discussion later and I haven't been back to the restaurant to help out since then. And this is teaching me that that is, I really appreciate you being here right now. This <laughs> but thank you for sharing that. Like even the fact that you took the time to talk to her later, mm -hmm. I, those are the kernels of build, building trust. Whether it didn't went in the way that maybe you could have expected or she could have expected, that's fine. But at least bringing light to it means that in her mind, she knows that you will not just walk out and leave it alone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That whether she wants to have you or not is something else, but she now will know that you are willing to say something, mm -hmm. you know? And Next question for you is um, what are the most common obstacles in building this trust system? What, what do you see people <laughs> are defeated by the most? Well, basically not sharing anything mm -hmm. like, um, you, you ask for feedback and people say it was great and they have another side conversation with said, well, I, I don't yeah. think it was that great and blah, blah, blah. And they don't say this to you, the presenter or the person, who, your, the manager who needs to hear that to fix the issue. Mm -hmm. Somehow believing that if they say it, you will feel offended. So mm -hmm. basically not trusting that you're a whole person who can understand uh, feedback and understand that you're coming with the best intentions. There's a whole dynamic that happens where you start doubting that the other person will not assume your best intentions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and things are left unsaid. So that's one of the... What happens, but what happens when the other person actually don't in, assume your best intent. How do you overcome that? What, like, what is your next step? <laughs> yes. Well, that's a great question. So uh, when uh, one of the ways to do that is to have a conversation. I have a, a little joke with uh, my partner, my girlfriend, and we said, in every movie, the conflicts could end in the minute five if they just had a conversation about what just happened. Uh, and, and I think many people have had this feeling like, oh, this movie was maybe interesting or entertaining, but unnecessary. If they just say, hey, I didn't like that you talked to me this way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously there are ways to express this better. And one of the obstacles also to building trust 
is that when we are not verse in expressing our disagreements, mm -hmm. when we express them, we are clumsy and we, we come across rude or we are so angry, there's been pent up anger. So we don't say anything, everything is great. And all of a sudden, rah, the monster is like, this is never gonna work. And there's a lot of black and white statements and, and people get surprised. Mm -hmm. And it's basically because the whole environment, the whole culture has not encouraged those tools, those systems to safely address it. Mm -hmm. Know that no one is gonna die <laughs> because of a disagreement. Being uncomfortable, we have heard this with the racial tension that we feel, feeling uncomfortable is not equally to feeling unsafe right mm -hmm. we can be we can have an uncomfortable discussion so fearing that the words are going to come across are wrong or misinterpret or actually sharing in a way that is actually disrespectful mm -hmm. another way that we have obstacles is not trusting yourself or others when they raise an issue for example oh what would they think about me if I raise this issue? I'm new, for example, uh, and I'm just raising this issue. If I arrive, I will come across as a, trouble, as a troublemaker, mm -hmm. or I've been here for years, and I just saw this issue that needs to be raised up. But if I raise it, I've been sharing this dysfunctional or this not very appropriate way of working, or mm -hmm. I might throw somebody else under the bus. Mm -hmm. and, in a trusting culture, this can be addressed and you will say, hey, I've been wrong and we can correct it now. And there is no, not necessarily that huge backlash that people fear. Mm -hmm. and promises that are not being kept. You told me you're gonna send me this. You didn't, uh, then you never explain why not. Uh, because many times uh, an explanation will solve it and said, yeah, you're late, but this happened and I will try to the schedule when it's systematic then you you feel like that's when distrust starts to build mm -hmm. uh, also like not finding the right channels to address something sometimes just an email is required and you don't need a whole meeting sometimes you need a meeting and the meeting needs to be open one-on-one -on -one with your boss for example mm -hmm. that I, I know you have every week which i think is very healthy if as open as as helpful as that is and as you, your boss and you are willing to hear feedback that you are not expecting mm -hmm. you know because you know everybody's coming with the best intentions and there's no side conversations or politics or things like that mm -hmm. um, another obstacle is um doubting your own intentions N like for example, you can have like, do I really want to be in this company, right? Mm -hmm. Do you want to be here? Is this really the right path for my career? And you're having that inner doubt. So when you are talking to your boss who's demanding or who's asking you to perform something and you're like, yeah, but I am, and you don't want to say you feel guilty, and then you don't respond the way you want to. And then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy Oh, I don't want to work here now. Um, if all their doubts could be, am I good enough? If I'm a manager, for example, mm -hmm. and I just got promoted. The imposter syndrome that we have, should I be really at this level? Should I, instead of being an assistant, I want to be a manager. I should be, I, be, I had the right experience. Mm -hmm. So all those kind of doubts, inner doubts that we have also are the things that we don't express are the things that we don't even deal with ourselves and become a factor that builds that obstacle to trust. Mm -hmm. Most definitely. What are um, some tangible benefits of developing that, um, that trust, that, that just that necessary understanding um, in a workplace? Ah, okay. Yes. Um, I would say some tangible, I will ask also our audience to think about this. What like to, to 
to get their wheels turning to see what benefits they, they can find that maybe I, I will not say on this. You know? mm -hmm. um, but if we just very, very easily, we have a study from Payscale that talks about the benefits of um, having trust at work. And I don't know if we can pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. This, this is pale scale. And it says that 72% of workers who are able to act and make decisions on their own say they're satisfied with their jobs. They feel they have autonomy. They are trusted. Mm -hmm. and, and they are happy to stay. And of those who are not given that autonomy, only 26% are happy to stay. Of those, uh, so 26% who don't get that autonomy are happy to stay. So that means 74% do not want to stay in an environment where there is no autonomy and trust given. 74%, mm -hmm. I look, I sound like Bernie Sanders now. 74%, 76% of those want to leave the workplace in six months, in less than six months. So people who don't feel trusted at work tend to leave work faster. Um, so yeah, we can have, we, maybe we can add this, uh, this uh, link on, on the chat we have on Facebook. Mm -hmm. And please interrupt me anytime if you or some of the viewers have any questions. Mm -hmm. um, and another tangible benefits is, as we see, the easy one to spot is turnover. You not only save in recruitment and training, but also in the time to get those new team members to gel with the rest of the team, get the projects going. Um, the, the, you are more able to detect uh, problems and not only detect them, but they detect them in a timely fashion. Oh, by the way, on trusten.net, all the stuff that we're working, trusten.net, you, you can see all, all of this uh, benefits, obstacles, all of this is there. Um, so you're invited to go to trusten.net. And I will definitely share that link. I will also share the link to this for our viewers um, when we're done here. So Beautiful. Thank you. So mm -hmm. just so you know, they get a little price of getting to see all these uh, steps that we're looking at. So you can detect the improvement areas. You can detect it timely so it doesn't become a bigger issue. Mm -hmm. And the whole team is able to create, to take creative risks. Uh, and they're happier to stay in this in a creative environment and they're just happy. And I also think like, why can't just being happy at work be a goal of itself? Like just knowing that you're gonna be happy at work, but the consequence really on productivity is that feeling fulfilled in your work career makes that the whole project and the organization be more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, and like we said before, workers are willing to go the extra mile when needed. And mm -hmm. this is not, there are not a lot of studies specifically about trust besides the pay scale and a few others, but for ane from anecdotal evidence, I know that goals are met faster. And I think many people see that this is obvious, but funny enough, there are no studies about this. But yeah, those I would say are the ones that pop into my mind. I'm curious to see if you or any other person on Facebook has more, not necessarily now, but later, whenever. Um, I have another question for you. Um, I, about performance and achieving goals. Why do you think people at work sometimes are having so much trouble in trusting in that area? Um, and what are ways that we can build trust in our workplace with what we know about that already? Yeah, I think one of them is that a lot of us have not developed the tools to deal uh, healthily with disagreements. Uh, we don't feel safe with ourselves even in those disagreements, we go like, oh, if I say something, will I 
say something inappropriate? Would I be more angry than I should? And all that self-doubt it makes you feel unsafe with you and others. So we have a few of us have that that need to improve our practice of how we address those issues with each other, how we disagree effectively, positively. Um, again, being uncomfortable is not equal to safe. Uh, and once you, for example, leave your day and feel that you were bothered by something and you have a moment to reflect with you, with a trusted friend and distill a little bit of what happened, go over it and have that space of reflection you can start seeing, oh, this was really my intention. And most of the time you realize all your intentions were good. We're good people. We're good people. And, mm -hmm. and all those fears makes us doubt ourselves. But we looked, oh, I just thought that this is what I wanted. He wanted this other person or she wanted this other thing. And we just couldn't explain it well. It, I would say 99% of the time where I distilled that in myself, I realized, Everyone has the best intentions, but we doubted everyone's intentions at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. um, so the first one is to develop that space of self-reflection. We call it an inner safe space. Mm -hmm. trust, learning how to trust yourself, not learning that you have your best intent, the best intentions of yourself and others and the project in hand. So you start creating that safe inner space. You have those comf uncomfortable conversations with yourself before you have with, with others. So this is about really building inner trust, building an inner safe space. Uh, and that takes time. That takes a little bit of work. Um, and once you get a little bit of muscle on that, you build a little bit of muscle on that inner safety, you start to... Uh, delineate boundaries with yourself and with your teams and whether if they're respectful and logical boundaries which when you have that inner safety they probably will be mm -hmm. others not like those boundaries but they know they're there they can trust that they will be there because you will be reinforcing them consistently then whether they initially like it or not doesn't matter. They trust that they're there and they will learn to trust you whether they initially like the boundaries or not. And uh, so the, that's the way you can start building it. And the cool thing about trust is that because it's inner trust, you can start right now. You don't need to wait for others to start trusting you. Mm -hmm. You can start developing that in yourself. And that gives you agency, that gives you empowerment and you start to get even better at trusting your own instincts, when to say what you need to say, how to say it. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a virtuous cycle where you feel more trusted in yourself because now your instincts are working for you. So uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of the approach that we take of building. We, we start with our own inner self, safe space, which starts with trusting yourself and developing those tools to to trust yourself and then it becomes how we can translate that to the culture of everyone but if everyone is doing their own self work it becomes much easier it becomes a culture that's why we have the workshops or the retreats over time mm -hmm. and what types of workshops have you designed to help address these matters yeah well uh we we start from like we were in a school where a lot of the members were new and they wanted and they wanted to integrate them that was a very simple uh, way to address trust uh, to having two organizations that have been working side by side but they finally merged and they have a little bit of a trusting issue with each other mm -hmm. so they just really didn't know each other and we started working to develop in those channels, those tools, so they can communicate better. Um, also, we we have designed a workshop for um, for our organization, a nonprofit who had a recent tragedy in in their staff, and somebody who was very meaningful to all the staff. 
So we develop a, a way to kind of learn to share a little bit of that grief, I guess, and in, in how they felt with each other, which was mm -hmm. a little bit more profound in that sense. But also we are in the middle of a pandemic. The way we address our communication with each other is different. Like the, it is a kind of a global tragedy that affects us directly at work because we cannot just go to the cubicle next door and tell them, hey, hey, I didn't get this, what happened? Or I don't understand what you just, you know, what is going on? And you just get that easy personal insight and just have to have a phone call or got an email and, you know, texts are not as deep. So that's also an opportunity for that. Um, also, let me see what I have here in my notes. Oh, yeah. Uh, we also designed another one for this environment that started to become more diverse. They were uh, adopting more diverse culture. Mm -hmm. But because of that diversity, people, because of the newness of the diversity, they, they wouldn't understand how to relate to each other. And would this be offensive to you? What would you think? Would I be racist if I say this or would I... Or, and sometimes they end up saying nothing to each other to improve the performance. No one says anything because they're afraid to come across wrong because they distrust uh, their others' best intentions and sometimes maybe their own best intentions because, but it's just that we're not practiced at interacting with other cultures, with other races, with other religions. And obviously, the result of that is that we are just people. <laughs> we are all sorts of ranches and all races, Latinos, and everybody has all differences of opinion, personalities. We can be any kind of people, you know, and, and, and that is a relief. Everybody is just a person, you know, and then I can say, hey, Monica, um, I, I read your email. I, I don't quite get it. Uh, can you explain it to me a little bit more? Can you clarify it for me? Okay, done. Um, so with the sign, uh, that, that, that took a lot of inner trust to build and into the workshop. Mm -hmm. So with that, you know, um, companies, especially if they're gonna be spending their money are very results focused and they wanna know that what they're investing their time and money in is working. How do you measure the results of how well your um, workshops are, um, if they're being effective, if there are things that need to be changed? Um, how do you measure that? What, what are your next steps? I love that question. So because every we have we usually when we start contacting uh, uh, our customers our clients they the first thing they say is that oh we have had all their workshops all their retreats where people give us these beautiful tools and they they leave us a, a whole notebook and a whole book uh, I don't know how you call it a manual or something yeah. Uh, Anger and all things to do. They did it in three days. It cost us this much money. They left. And now we're using these tools and we forgot. We, you know, we, and, and we don't know how applicable this is anymore to us. So that's one thing where we, on top of the fact that we do a lot of this uh, learning through games with with playful activities, which actually opens up. On top of that, what we do is that we don't necessarily do everything at once. We start on the first meeting, we developed this first meeting interview with our customer where we hear and we explore deeply what is it that they really need. We prepare our first workshop, we provide some tools, and the next let's say we meet for two, three hours that day. But the next module, tools or whatever subject we want to address is not going to happen in the afternoon. We're going to let this go over time, see how people use them, see what the results were, evaluate them, and then do the next module. 
and we, we give two weeks, we give one month in between, and we do the next one. So we keep in between those modules, uh, we are available, we are accessible, we have certain hours where we can address the issues that you've been having. And before we start the next one, we make sure that we're going in the right direction. So that initial goal that we have, we're getting, we're getting there. Mm -hmm. So these are soft skills, so they're called, which I, I think are the most productive mm -hmm. uh, uh, skills in terms of results. Mm -hmm. We are people working together, and until we're fully replaced by robots, we still need to deal with each other. So, so we, so that's the way. So we keep tweaking if we need to, and but before we add the next next tools. We know that these tools are already starting to permeate the culture and they're being used. And, and you will see it instead of just kind of do a short test after, after if you got all memorized. No, you will practice it, you will use it, and you will see its actual value in real time. And we will be there with you. So that's kind of uh, what we do. I like that. Um how would I know if my team needs this type of training? What are the signs that I should be looking for? Yes, uh, the, the clear, one of the clear signs that you see is that people, maybe I, you are afraid to say what you feel to some other person. You, you have a certain apprehension before addressing somebody because of whatever reason or they have some apprehension uh, towards you. You start seeing that everybody says yes to what you said forever. And there's no like, oh, maybe I have a different idea. You, you want your team to express different ideas. Uh, or when the ideas are expressed, they are expressed roughly and clumsily and angrily, you know. Uh, Another clear sign is side conversations. When people just talk to their colleague, which I'm not saying they're not helpful for a moment, but mm -hmm. then they don't bring it up to the person who can actually address the issue. Mm -hmm. That's a sign. Um, so, so yeah, fearful fear of disagreement. Uh, you have, for example, new personnel coming in and you want to integrate them and you're not sure how to do it, that's a good sign that you might need a workshop like this. Mm -hmm. uh, do you want to spark the creativity of your team? And they don't, and usually everyone is creative. We're just sometimes afraid of our own creativity. We're, mm -hmm. We don't trust it. So mm -hmm. that's where we come in. Uh, when you start noticing that there's high turnover in companies, which I think a lot of people can relate and they have seen those signs in companies they have worked with. High turnover, that, 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 that seems that something is not working regarding trust. Mm -hmm. uh, and like I said, tragic events, a pandemic, things like this, where you are unable to communicate the way you used to, how can you develop other channels that will at least aim at giving us the same kind of report that we had before? Mm -hmm. I have a question coming in from one of our viewers. Um, Lauren wants to know, how would you build trust in your team, even if you are not the manager or supervisor? What are some things employees can do to build trust with their teammates? That's a good question. Yeah. Well, that that is a very interesting uh, point of view because we have this uh, normal idea that if or widely known idea that if the manager has this this way of working, this way of doing things, then it will just come down to everyone. And that is somewhat possible, and sometimes it happens, but usually when the team from the ground up has built their own inner trust and they start relating to each other, they, they have a strong core and and they can, they can bring that up to the manager, they can bring it up to the organization. You can start building it. You start with yourself, then the next person you talk to, 
every day, the one that you have more frequency in connections with, they will they will start understanding it. Uh, and it's it's a little bit as they see that it's working for, for, for you, they probably start imitating because they see that you're relaxed, they see that you feel better, they see that you're raising issues. And it's amazing what happens when people see that in somebody else. It's like, oh, we, uh, like like we said, we can only have access to the op to the options we can imagine. Once you see it, you go like, oh, I can do this. Mm -hmm. So it becomes very organic, and and the staff can have a workshop, you know, without the manager and in, 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 in doing that too. Mm -hmm. I like that answer. Um, so if company companies want to contact you um, with how to, oh, Lauren said really great information and she said, thank you. Oh, thank you, Lauren. <laughs> so um, if com companies or individuals in companies want to contact you um, to get this going, what are the first steps um, necessary? Perfect. The first step is write to Luis, L-U-I-S, at trusten.net. Luis at trusten.net. So that's L-U-I-S at T-R-U-S-T-T-E-N dot net. Trust and then E-N, yeah. T-R-U-S-T-E-N dot net. Okay. Uh, they can go to my website, trusten.net, and they can also connect with me, but just write to me. We'll set up an initial meeting free. And because our purpose is to really give the result that the company want, we have an in-depth uh, initial meeting where we really see what are the what, what is it that what are the results that the company is really looking for. So as precise as we can define them at the beginning will be what will give us at the end the right result that we want. Like mm -hmm. this relates a little bit to the previous question. So that first meeting, write to me at Luis at trusting.net. We, we set up a meeting and uh, we define precisely the goal so we can aim at, at it at the end. Awesome. I really appreciate that answer. So we saw um, some of your cool videos. Um, well, we saw part of it at the beginning. Um, how does this work in a pandemic? What are you doing? Are you not going crazy right now? <laughs> I was going crazy at the beginning. <laughs> I bet I was. <laughs> I was like, but we are all based in social interaction, social games. And that was our main goal. And we had a lot of workshops, a few workshops already lined up to do, and we just had to stop them because everybody was reimagining, oh, sorry, how they were going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm happy to announce that we already have our, we already did our first test pilot webinar and we're designing a workshops, talks, retreats that can be done outdoors and then mm -hmm. so obviously socially distance maybe even with masks but if we are enough distance maybe we can even see our faces for a second mm -hmm. and, and then we do a little bit of virtual and yeah we are combining those two ways and we are right. to do as most in person as possible but also, the cool thing is about that virtually, well, I still have time, that virtually games are based also on challenges and being virtual posts a challenge. Mm -hmm. right? And like in soccer, you can't use hands unless you're the goalie, for example, and mm -hmm. other sports, you have to use a racket or this also posts a gaming challenge and we take advantage of that too. That's awesome. I really appreciate that. You know, um, we face that challenge a lot at Dream Bank because we're used to being in this amazing space and being in person with our coworkers and being able to communicate with our community of dreamers in person all the time. And um, I love your space. <laughs> I, I used to go there all the time. 
I absolutely miss it. I miss it so much. Um, so with with that idea and um, what we've learned from you today, it all of it together is just a huge appreciation. Um, it gives me new appreciation for where I am physically right now, <laughs> which is in a room with this um, very shady backdrop. But um, it gives me a different type of appreciation for that. And um, it, I appreciate my team in a way that I didn't appreciate them before because we're not face to face anymore and um, communicating with them has, um, has been pretty challenging in some ways um, in different aspects. So yeah, having that is amazing. Um, we're winding down to the end here and I have a couple of videos of yours that I wanna show. I'm gonna try to be all technical and pull this up while we're on here. Um, do you need to do an introduction or anything of these videos before I pull them up? Um, yeah. Um these videos are uh, of a couple of organizations we work, schools, and Centro Hispano. And um, they, they show some of the activities that we do. They mm -hmm. are silly and they are fun. And it's amazing how silliness lets all those complex ideas penetrate so much faster. Playfulness allows comprehension so much faster. And I do have studies about that. <laughs> so we're gonna see those activities and we're gonna see what people who were in the workshop thought of the workshop. Let them speak for themselves. All right, give me just a second to pull this up. Yes, that's the first one, yeah. Can we, do we have video? The second video? No, no, do we have audio, sorry? Oh, I have audio on this end, you can't hear it? I can't, but maybe our viewers can, I don't know. So can I, we start from the beginning? Yeah, I'll start from the beginning again. Um, I can hear it. I'm unable to hear it from here. I hate that you can't hear it because I can hear it just fine over here. Okay. I'm just gonna play it. I hope that our viewers um, can hear it. I will watch this back when we're done and I will know for myself if they heard it or not. Either way, we'll have the links to your videos, the links to um, your company website and the link to um, the website that we was just looking at a second ago. So I'm gonna make sure all of that is available to our viewers. I'm gonna- I'm going oh, to play. Make that my email, Luis at trusting.net there too. Okay, I can definitely do that. Thank you, Monica. You're welcome.
is the internet a little stuck there? Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, so I'm getting messages from our viewers that the audio is not working and from my team members. Um, so we're just going to skip that because I'm not okay. sure what's happening. I'm going to grab these links really quick to make them so that our viewers can pull these up. Give me just a second here. Sounds good. I yeah. love this. I love this technical difficulty stuff. <laughs> yeah. Is the is the how I say like is 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 in vogue. Yes, definitely. Sign of the times. All right. So I have both of the video links in there now for our viewers to take a look at. And um, I'm going to get the other links on there as soon as we're done here. I just wanted to wrap things up by saying um, I really, really appreciate your time today. Um, speaking with you has helped shine some light on some situations that I'm going through. Um, like I said, personally, totally outside of work, but still a work type of related situations. And I, I see quite a few areas of my life where I could use the advice that I got from you today. So I really, really appreciate that. Um, Thank you, Monica. Yes. Thank you so much for being with us today. Um, I want to thank all of our viewers out there for tuning in. Um, be sure to look out for our new back to school series. We're going to have just a few events happening around that, getting parents, teachers, and students prepared to work um, this hybrid school year for most people. Um, we're offering mental health guidance and some information on how to get the necessary supplies that you need um, going into the school year. Um, again, thank you so much for being with us today, Louise. Um, I look forward to working with you again in the near future. And to all of our dreamers out there, thank you for tuning in and continue to dream fearlessly. Bye. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Dream Bank. <laughs>